Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Luis Guevara. I'm the Senior Academic Program Coordinator with the Department of Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies, which is a unit of the College of Liberal Arts here at the University of Texas at Austin. And on behalf of our chair, Dr. Karma Chavez, the faculty, staff, and students associated with MALS and overall with Latino Studies, we want to welcome you to La Llegada uh, Student Research Symposium Part 2. Part one was yesterday. We have three different students today and this afternoon. Uh, each of our students, and I'll introduce them to you all in just a minute, uh, will have 15 minutes for a presentation with five minutes for Q&A. After the last presentation, though, we will have about 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Questions from the audience should be typed into the chat feature here in Zoom. Uh, we're not going to take any oral questions the way the webinar is set up. And then if you've got any questions and you drop them into the Q&A feature, I will go ahead and uh, double check them as well, um, just to make sure we have all the questions from the audience for each student. Uh, once again, uh, each of them get 15 minutes. They will do great work uh, and uh, please en engage them with your questions in the chat. So at this time, let me introduce our first presenter for today. Uh, I'll introduce each one of them and then we'll start with our first one. Our first presenter is Aris Moreno Clemens. Uh, she is a PhD candidate in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, completing the graduate portfolio in Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies. The title of her talk today, They Spanish, They Ain't Black, Racial Linguistic Stance Taking and the Construction of Dominica, Do, Dominicanidad in the United States. Our second presenter is Alexandria Lexi Perez Allison. She's a PhD candidate in the Department of English also completing a graduate portfolio in Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies. The title of her talk today is Chicana Interventionist Archives, Teaching from the Cotilde P. Garcia Papers. And our third presenter today is Nathaniel Rossi. He is completing the PhD as a candidate in the Department of Radio, Television, Film, as, long, as well as the graduate portfolio in Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies. The title of his presentation today, Filming Ghosts, Visualizing Memory and Loss in Documentaries about El Salvador and Guatemala's Niños Desaparecidos. So once again, Aris, Lexi, and Nathan will be our presenters today. And so at this point, let me introduce Aris Clemens to her, do her presentation. Aris? So I'm still um, disabled from sharing my screen. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if if you click on me as a participant, uh, Luis, you'll be able to make me a co-host and that might be able to fix it. Yes, let me see. Hang on, I'm working on that right now. No worries. <clears throat> Okay, give that a try. Still no? Okay, hopefully people can see my screen now. I'm gonna try. I can tell you, I can see your screen. So that much is, is possible, yes. Oh, good. All right, so we started. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here with me. Um, as we said, my talk entitled They Spanish, They Ain't Black, Racial Linguistic Stance Taking and the Construction of Dominicanidad in the United States is part of my larger dissertation work. So um, it's concerned with my larger research agenda, which questions the ways that ethno-racial categories come to be, including the ways that these categories are talked about, the ways that they're acquired, um, and more importantly, the ways that they're contested. So I know uh, some of you may have already heard this if you've heard me talk already, but I always begin my, my discussions with a brief talk about myself. And I think it's important as a way to be transparent on how I came to the research so that my choices about my research frames, my questions, and ultimately um, my interpretations become more clear. So I'm originally from the Bay Area in California. I spent much of my formative years watching my grandmother and her activist colleagues defend the rights of African-American language and what would lead up to the Oakland Ebonics debates of the 1990s, as a child of the 1990s as well. Um, I was sent to an African-American Montessori school and instruction happened in English, in French, and Swahili. 
my father's African American and my mother is um, from Martinique. <clears throat> so I was raised around this kind of black diaspora of like hemispheric blackness, which really grounded me both in a passion for language diversity as well as for black liberatory struggles. And that brings me into my entry into Dominicanness or Dominicanidad. Um, so at age 19, I decided to move to Spain to complete my undergraduate studies. And when I got there, <clears throat> it was very clear to many people that I was not like the sub-Saharan African that they had been used to with uh, black subjectivities, nor was I American in what had been conceived of as like a United Statesian. So when many people saw me, what they saw was like a black Latina. And as I began interacting more and more with the Dominicans who were the largest population of black Latin Americans at the time, in Madrid, um, I began to notice the similarities between Dominican cultural practices and those of my um, Caribbean family back at home. And so I had grown up in this diasporic enclave where heritage from any of the Caribbean islands um, made you automatic family. Um, and then that made me begin to kind of question this separation, this ideological separation between what amounted to be like Anglo, French, and Dutch Caribbean from uh, the Spanish Caribbean, where we were all considered Black, and then everybody from Spanish Caribbean was considered Hispanic or Latino racially. So this separation has kind of driven much of my research. And of course, now that I'm armed with a lot more historical knowledge and social cultural knowledge, my goal is to demystify this separation. So today, my aim is to reveal the ways that boundaries of race are constructed um, in an educational context, even with a seemingly homogenous group. So the, the current study um, examines a significant moment of linguistic profiling in the planning and execution of a Black History Month celebration in 2016 at a Brooklyn high school. Um, in describing this moment, I, theor about, I theorize about the ways that language informs ethno-racial developments um, I also use the Black History Month show as an anchor to consider how racial scripts and the negotiation of space provide a basis for the creation of boundaries around these identity categories. I then examine the ways in which school policies and practices promote an active erasure of Blackness as a central element of Latinidad. And lastly, I reflect on the um, the implementation of culturally relevant pedagogies and practices within a school setting that had a highly heterogeneous population, despite the institutional classificatory um, practices that marked them as homogeneously Black or has homogeneously Hispanic, as if these two categories were mutually exclusive. And so the study employed a, a combined critical race and anthropolitical linguistic ethnography method, which allowed for me to incorporate several data points. Um, I took from extensive field notes that were originally taken as a way to catalog and improve future programming. I also did six student interviews addressing their ethno-racial identities in the summer directly following the Black History Month show. I conducted four additional student reflection interviews following uh, the student's graduation from college. And then I did four teacher and staff interviews reflecting on the changes over time um, regarding these kind of culturally responsive programming. It's important to note that at the time, uh, the pre preliminary data collection, I consider myself a researcher in practice um, as I was working at the school and constantly taking notes and collecting data with the aim of challenging the structural norms, both at the school and at the network level of the school. So the project was part of a larger push to incorporate Black history electives, Spanish and Haitian Creole language programs, as well as experiential learning through travel abroad. Importantly, this work grew from a need to challenge the dominant assumptions and what I was seeing uh, in school meetings and leadership meetings, uh, that there was this assumption that minoritized students, especially language minority students, needed to be educated in hegemonic English language norms in order to allow them to overcome detrimental life expect expectancy and material conditions associated with Black populations. Um, so a very brief sociopolitical overview of the school, I, I call the school Hispaniola High because there was a large population of Dominicans and Haitians, um, but it was originally housed in a converted elementary school in the Bushwick region of Br Brooklyn, and this region has a large population of Puerto Ricans, African Americans, and Dominicans, but Dominicans represented the largest population at the school, uh, and even so there was no explicit celebration of this, but Dominican presence was really felt uh, 
Students used to bring pastelitos to sell at school. Um, they played baseball over all other sports and, and professed the dominance due to Dominican platano power. Um, they played bachata and dembo at the dances just as much as they played any hip hop or R&B. Um, but what, um, in what might have felt like an overnight shift, the context was nearly reversed in the fall of 2013 when the school moved to Flatbush, uh, the Flatbush region of Brooklyn. And since many of the Dominican families decided to not send their children there because the travel was too far um, and the admissions occurred with the new population in mind, the Haitian, West Indian, Africa, African-American population significantly grew as the Dominican population diminished. Nonetheless, the majority of the students were um, marked as either below grade average um, and as uh, low income students. Uh, and there was a large variety of students that, that were at the school, but instruction was offered mostly in English. And the goal was to kind of bring students up to college ready. Um, and they did that through this work readiness program that focused on academic literacy couched in professionalism. So despite the fact that there was a wide and varying linguistic ability of students, the school functioned uh, in what Williamson and I have termed uh, an English mostly space. So when I started working there in 2012, everybody told me that uh, the Black History Month celebration was the largest school event. So on the last Friday of every February, students would celebrate with poetry, dance, song, um, and a fashion show. And after two years of volunteering behind the scenes, one in the school's former location and one in the new building, I began to notice two things. The first was, although my family had kind of uh, socialized me into the celebration of Blackness, many of my students and the educators they were working with had effectively been robbed of any significant education regarding hemispheric or diasporic Black history. So though the students were celebrating their culture through art, the history was decidedly lacking in the school curriculum. And um, because of this, as an extension, it was also missing from the show. So this feeling was expressed by some of the students and one commented, quote, the Black History Month show was basically an excuse to showcase our culture. So we didn't really have much Black history. It was more like a showcase of our culture at the time. My second realization was that there was a clear divide in who was involved. The event was like visually diasporic with students representing parentage through the waving of flags, but students of African descent from Spanish speaking countries were almost completely left out. Many of the students didn't even show up to the event and in a space that was so heavily occupied by bodies that were clearly marked by African descent, I began to kind of question this role of racial categorizations as they existed in the United States and in the school in particular. Um, I, like many born in the United States, had been inculcated into this notion of a racial binary, which um, rested on a one drop rule. So even the history lessons and, and diaspora that my parents had exposed me to didn't prevent this kind of common sense understanding of race where one drop of African ancestry automatically pushed somebody into the category of black. So armed with this understanding, I, I started to question the marked absence of about 40% of the school population. I also begin to, to question this absence in the face of active participation by Black Caribbean and Central American um, of Garifuna um, origins students, as well as first generation Anglophone, Francophone, and African um, students. So I began to question what was the boundary of difference between Black and Hispanic in a context where nearly everyone involved had at least some trace of Sub-Saharan African uh, ancestry. So by my third year at the school, I was asked to take over the planning and execution of the event. And I vowed to remedy what I saw as an exclusion of certain black uh, subjectivities, as well as the lack of history. So students would be learning something about black history uh, by attending the show. Uh, and we would celebrate people of all African descent, which seemed easy enough, but in the end, it was not easy at all. Um, so less than two weeks into planning the event, I was breaking up a, a large screaming match between the Dominican bachata dance group and the West Indian uh, dance crew. An argument over rehearsal space quickly evolved into one of who more authentically deserved to be there in the first place. After hearing shout shouting come from the uh, auditorium, I entered to see what was going on. Um, and when I got there, both groups had declared that they had uh, the stage reserved for the rehearsal. While the Dominican bachata group had a faculty chaperone, 
The West Indian dance crew did not. And asking, and after asking them where their faculty advisor was, um, I had told them that they could not, they could not practice there without adult supervision. So in that moment, the leader of the West Indian dance crew, Natasha, turned to her group members and said, and I quote, well, you know, Miss Clemens is Spanish anyway, so we should have known they were, she was going to take their side. I don't even know why they are here. It's Black History Month, not Spanish History Month, right? End quote. So in one phrase, she had assigned me to an entirely different racial category than the one that I claimed for myself. And in doing this, she had effectively called for my exclusion as well as the exclusion of the Dominican students from any celebration of Blackness. So a simple scheduling mishap had turned into an ideological battle where race and language had been conflated and Afro-Latinx or Dominicanidad didn't really exist. To Natasha, the Dominican girls were not Black enough to participate in the Black History Month show. In her mind, the mere fact that they spoke Spanish completely erased any connection to their African descent. In this case, the one drop rule has been reconstituted uh, and to include language. And furthermore, my Spanish language ability aligned me with Latinidad, and so I was perceived as an outsider. Um, in this moment, I thought, how can I teach a complete history of colonialism and its effects on the African um, diaspora in an instance, uh, especially in a context where Black histories were decidedly missing? So in the moments after my initial shock uh, and kind of uh, annoyance at this situation, uh, I composed myself and I looked at Natasha and I, and I asked, I said, well, Tanya speaks Creole and French and she's part of your dance crew. How come she gets to be black and we don't? So in that moment, Natasha's face went from momentary confusion to full understanding. And I knew that I had succeeded in at least teaching one lesson. And that was that speaking a different language, a colonial one at that, um, was not the sole determinator, determiner of racial identity. Um, but one issue remained, and that was that the students really had no concept of the socio-historic context that had led us to the kind of conflict in the first place. So while Dominican students had traditionally been excluded from the Black History Month show for all of these reasons of, of the boundaries that were created, I wanna note that this exclusion was not based on malice or a blindness to the physical appearance of many of these students. Um, Jean, who later became the African-American studies teacher, commented that her lack of engagement with Dominican students was a result of the deficiencies in her own educations about hemispheric Blackness. So after directing the Black History Month show and arguing for increased conversations about history based in pan-Caribbean narratives that would be um, directly related to the context of the school, the school did implement a small number of student-centered initiatives. Um, in returning to the school in 2018, I was happy to see a heterogeneous Black population represented in the Black History Month show, um, but several questions remain. I ask how we can build curriculums that not only reflect what is important to the school, the nation state, um, but also ones that reflect the diverse backgrounds of the students who occupy those spaces. I wonder how a large scale inclusion of culturally reflective curriculums affect the development identity, uh, the development of identity for these students, um, as well as their academic success. And lastly, and more aligned with my overall research agenda, I ask us to consider how focusing on language practices in both performance and proficiency can give us insight into the identity construction of these students. I argue that one of the ways to intentionally widen hemispheric understandings of Black identity is to integrate more content-based language classes where authentic materials can be drawn from Afro-descended and Indigenous communities. In April Baker Bell's 2020 proposal of anti-racist Black language pedagogies, she calls for um, teachers to create activities that allow students to develop critical awareness. Um, as well as to interrogate how other linguistically and racially diverse communities experience racial and linguistic violence. I suggest that this linkage of Spanish to Latinidad is part and parcel of this anti-Black linguistic racism, which um, occurs through the erasure of Black Latinx subjects. As such, I believe that language courses should be taught through a wider and more directed history curriculum that acknowledges the similarities and differences between varying colonial frames of power, and I suggest that our existing classroom pedagogies can be expanded to include a hemispheric understanding of Blackness. In this way, at least for students who share Black languages, I argue that hemispheric Black language pedagogy would lead to a rejection of these boundary making projects that have resulted in the linguistic and racial traumas that many of our students experience within these uh, educational spaces. <laughs>
So thank you all so much for sharing this time with me. I look forward to speaking uh, with you a little bit more about it during question and answer. So I'm, I guess I think I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, excellent. Thank you, Adis. Um, questions from the audience for Adis in the chat, please. Or if you have questions in the Q&A feature, that's fine as well, but questions through the chat or Q&A, please. So I see a question in the question and answer that says, uh, how does your thinking about hemispheric language also inform the development and use of black English, if at all? Um, so in the particular context that I'm talking about, it influences it a lot because there is this, often when we talk about like language contact in these communities and the acquisition of like um, black English or African-American English, it's always seems like it's a one-way direction. So immigrant populations come in, they live in close contact with African-Americans, they, they acquire that language um, as, a, as a first language many times for second generation people, um, and then they have to deal, deal with that issue. But in these contexts, it, it often happens back and forth. So this school was in New York, and I can think of numerous amounts of time where African-American students are also using um, either Spanish phrases or Hispanicized phrases in their daily language. Um, and that is uh, a part of how teachers then read their linguistic repertoires uh, and, and reprimand them for the use of these kinds of languages. Um, and so I think when we expand the ways that we think about how language uh, functions in general and how it's developed through contact practices, but also through in my other chapters of the dissertation, I talk about how it's developed through similar processes. So if we think about survival of the transatlantic slave trade, many black language practices include things like rapid innovations um, because there had to be code languages that could be created that wouldn't be understood by the master classes. So we start thinking about these processes then we're able to understand a little bit more about how students um, are responding to the, the cultural situations that exist um, in their particular context. Do we have any other questions at this time for Aris? Once again, there will be 20 minutes toward the end of our session for group questions and a question can be directed to her at that time. All right, so at this time then, I'm gonna to transition to our next speaker, Lexi Perez. Uh, and Lexi will have 15 minutes or so to do her presentation and uh, five minutes for Q&A. And then we will transition to our last speaker. Once again, we have time at the end to, uh, to hold questions for all of the group. But at this point, let's transition to Lexi Perez. Sounds good, I'm gonna share my, okay. I'm also having uh, the disabled screen sharing. But yeah, I'm working I'm on that right now, Lexi. Okay. I'm sorry um, about the slight delay. Sorry, give me a second. Oh, I had it right now. 
Um, I, I think somehow I was made host, so maybe I can fix it. Okay, maybe now. Thank you, Nathan, appreciate that. Alexi, go ahead, please. Lexi, you're muted. Oh, okay, we're good. Can I just get confirmation that my screen is, you're seeing it? Yeah, it's up there. Great, thank you. Um, okay. So good af afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm sharing some research for an article that I'm preparing. So it's a work in progress. And like many works in progress, the title is an ever shifting thing. So um, right now, my working title is Chicana Movida Archives, Teaching from the Clotilde P. Garcia Papers. Um, yeah. So this is just a quick outline of where uh, we'll be going to during today's presentation. First, I wanna share the origins of this project, um, how I came to know the materials, where it's coming from. And then I wanna share some background on the Clotilde P. Garcia, um, on her and the materials I found in the archive. Then I wanna shift to the theoretical framework I'm using, this Chicana Movidas framework, um, and then finally end briefly touching upon reading Chicana liter letters as literature in the classroom and the benefits of, of that work. So where it comes from, uh, I taught Chicana literature for the first time as a graduate student here at UT. And one of my favorite texts to teach for the class was uh, Norma Ganthu's Ganicula not only uh, because of its genre bending experimental nature, but because my students seem to be really engrossed in what they call the realistic elements of the text. So when I asked them to compare reading this novel to say reading something like House on Mango Street, students often answered, this one seems so real, or the photographs that Kanthu includes as part of the novel make it seem like it actually happened or it's actually part of my family, it seems so real. And so despite its complicated generic form and its lack of a traditional linear plot line, I learned that my students enjoyed Canicula because these primary documents provided a non-fictional element that they uh, could more easily connect to their own lived experiences. And I kept the student feedback in mind as I began planning to teach a Mexican American literature survey course the following year. And I was um, fortunate to get support from the Benson and work with Albert Palacios and other digital specialists to locate materials from the archive um, and have them digitized for use in the classroom. And so these materials were brought into the course as part of class discussion, close reading exercises, and as source material for short research essays. However, out of all of the primary documents and stuff that we put together for this Canvas packet, there was this one material that really held my attention more than any of the others. It was a letter I found in the Clotilde P. Garcia papers written in 1973 from a high school girl named Gloria Ann Blanco, asking, I mean, really trying to persuade Garcia to write her a rec letter to get into UC Irvine. And it's uh, three of these, the letters, three of these uh, ruled uh, loose leaf papers that you see here. And uh, Blanco also includes a photo of herself that is on this next slide. And so what struck me the instant I started reading, aside from these material aspects I shared, was this line from the opening. It was Dr. Cleo, I hope you remember me. Olga's daughter, the one with the glasses who's allergic to penicillin. And I was just really struck by these familiar details, the personal connection she tries to make in her beginning, um, her assertiveness as she continues her voice. Um, and as I kept reading, I started noticing these rhetorical moves that Blanco's using in order to advocate for herself. Um, in particular, something I noticed midway into the letter is she actually shifts into a, you know, what we would call a Chicana um, rhetoric from the Chicano movement. So I'll read a quote that you probably can't see here, but um, an example of this is when she says, Dr. Cleo, I intend to finish what I start, meaning I will not drop out of college to get married and take up housekeeping in the barrios of East LA. 
I feel I am worth more than that. And oh, my rasa, all I can offer it. Right now, I am involved in Mecha, trying to start an alternative school. I am also working on an ad hoc committee to incorporate East LA. And lastly, I work part-time in a legal aid office, which helps people from the barrio who can't afford to pay for legal defense. I really enjoy this, right? So I was really taken by all the different um, moves she takes in this letter to try and persuade Garcia, someone she um, hasn't seen in a really long time. And so as a result, I became a little obsessed with this letter and finding out more about uh, Garcia, uh, the one whom you know, this Chicana young woman is trying to persuade. And as um, a native from Corpus Christi, I was familiar with Garcia. There are buildings and um, streets named after her and her brother Hector. Um, and she was actually my mother and my grandmother's doctor for periods of time. But I didn't know a lot about her background or her position within Chicanx studies, and I wanted to learn more. So I looked into Tarot and the Texas State Historical Handbook and learned that Garcia was a many things. She was a physician, activist, author, educator, born in Tamaulipas in 1917, one of seven children born to a college professor and a school teacher. She earned a master's degree in education working with George I. Sanchez, and she also earned a medical degree um, from UTMB. And after she finished her education, Garcia began her medical practice in Corpus Christi, where she earned a reputation as, quote, a devoted medical practitioner and community advocate. And, um, she was active in the civil rights movement alongside her brother Hector, who founded the American GI Forum in 1948. Um, and as an activist, she led the um, American GI Women's GI Forum Women's Auxiliary and served um, as the national health director for LULAC. However, the more I looked into Garcia and her background, she actually began to stand out to me as more of a contradictory figure. Garcia was indeed a champion of civil rights and an advocate for her patients and her community. Um, but I found some ambivalence um, around her inclusion within a history of Chicana activism. Um, as a Mexican-American woman who came of age early in the 20th century, she sort of predates the movement era and participates in a different earlier generation of activism. Um, as an educated white collar worker, she doesn't possess a lot of the working class identity markers that were then essential to a Chicano movement politics. Um, but some scholarship does categorize her as a uh, Chicano activist akin to organizers like Emma Tenayuca and Virginia Aguirre Mosquiz. But in contrast, Corpus Christi and the Corpus Christi Color Times does not paint her at all as the type of like Chicana reformer. For example, their influential Women of South Texas article labels her as a physician, community activist, and genealogist. Um, and I looked into this and um, it, it made sense. Uh, Corpus Christi, right, as a space of Chicano activism has always been sort of ambivalent and has often privileged the desires of its elite Anglo population over its Mexican American communities and has often sought to recognize its Spanish colonial history rather than acknowledge a Tijano or Chicano, its Tijano or Chicano roots. And Garcia was actually a critical patron of some of these efforts. As a scholar and a genealogist of South Texas, she actually has written books celebrating and uh, documenting South Texas colonialism that we actually have here at the at UT Austin libraries. She also coordinated Corpus Christi's Miradores del Mar cultural heritage site which was originally eight Spanish style gazebos that lined the Bayfront and depict historical figures of South Texas, such as um, King ranch owner, Captain Richard King, Spanish explorers, Alonso de Pineda and uh, Alvaro Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, Spanish missionary, Padre Jose Nicolas Valle, and US General Zachary Taylor. And to add insult to injury, this project, uh, this large Spanish colonial project was constructed as part of the 500th uh, celebratory anniversary of Columbus's sale to um, the New World, right? Uh, so this project further privileged the region's colonial heritage and really neglected its Mexican American culture. So although um, Although Garcia's identity really straddles these positions of affluence and activism, 
I contend that this ambivalence makes her a fitting subject for my project. And I wanted to look at her um, activism through this lens of movidas articulated by Maria Cotera, Meili Blackwell, and Dion Espinosa in their anthology, and which I'll describe a bit here. So for these scholars, the term movidas, which translates into English as moves, signifies, quote, a mode of submerged and undercover activity. With connotations of both the strategic and the illicit, movidas are outside of the specular range of large scale political and social relations. Enacted in back rooms and bedrooms, hallways and kitchens, they are collective and individual maneuvers undertaken in a context of social mobilization that seek to work within, around, and between the positionings, ideologies, and practices of publicly visual social relations. And in their movie, the movie, this anthology, Ana Nieto Gomez unpacks uh, this term hallway movidas, which are described as working within, through, and around movement era hegemonies. In these hallway movidas, they sort of categorize them as some of this early pre-movement activism that uh, did not always address the full array of issues impacting women of color. And yet the Gomez explains how these hallway movidas require researchers to shift their analytical lens away from leaders of social movements and towards the day-to-day -day activities and experiences that shape a Chicana feminist practice. And actually in this chapter in her essay, Nieto Gomez mentions Garcia and her work with Aglifa and Lulaca, the women's counterparts of LULAC and the American GI Forum. And in her mention of these organizations, she admits that their goals, quote, did not start out advancing a feminist agenda, end quote. These separate women's groups were created more with the intention to support their dominant male counterparts than to address a feminist platform. Yet, yet the Gomez's essay emphasizes how Garcia's work and those like her working in this space can, quote, reveal genealogical connections between Chicana efforts to establish a number of organizations, service centers, and research initiatives in the 70s and the work of this earlier generation of activists. So consequently, I maintain that this concept of hallway movidas can be an insightful way to consider Garcia's pre-movement activism, but it's especially appropriate to read her correspondence with Blanco that I, um, I was so uh, fascinated by. You know, despite Garcia's resistance to a woman of color feminist agenda, this letter reveals the genealogical connections between this earlier generation of activism and Chicana initiatives in the 70s. Through this letter, we witness a direct link from pre-movement era women's organizations to 70s Chicana feminist organizations signified by Blanco's use of a Chicana feminist rhetoric and her persuasion through um, her activist work. Um, and although I have not been able to track Blanco's post-grad trajectory, the fact that the letter remains in Garcia's personal paper signifies it was at the least received um, and kept, which suggests she might have completed the favor to help um, a Chicana in need who's advocating for herself. Thus, through the archive, we witness the hallway movida of writing a recommendation letter for a high school girl, an act that goes unseen, is not broadcasted on any political platform, and yet moves La Causa a few steps farther. Indeed, it is Garcia's affluence and privilege that allows her to be so present in the archive. She has papers both at UT Austin and Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Articulated best by scholar Maria Cotera, quote, with scant institutional archives dedicated to the legacy of Chicana feminism and few secondary sources that document this history, scholars must frequently create their own archives, methodologies, and genealogies, end quote. And by looking at this correspondence, I argue that we can build another small genealogical branch between pre-movement women's organizations and Chicano feminist activism. And the archive helps make this possible. And then quickly, I wanna wrap up by talking about reading these letters as literature in the classroom. So in tandem with this historical interpretation, uh, it's also worth reading Blanco's letter through literary close reading. It's a great text to close read in class. Uh, the letter form, like other life writing genres, can be a powerful tool in the classroom to connect close reading practices with real life, as my students suggested, and therefore is worth and great for formalist analysis. 
So I just want to um, bring up a few uh, points that my students made when we uh, looked at this text together in class. Um, I'm looking about her looking at her uh, rhetorical moves such as establishing personal connections at the front, building up her character and her work ethic. We had a discussion about her invocation of movement rhetoric and whether um, this helped this added to her persuasive persuasive effect or perhaps did not. Um, and then this anaphora this re repetition of Dr Cleo that this rhythm that um, continues throughout the whole letter. She begins each paragraph with Dr. Cleo, Dr. Cleo, Dr. Cleo, and the um, rhetoric power behind that device. And so I just want to end saying that uh, there are so many pedagogical benefits of primary documents in the classroom, and it can be a great methodology for teaching rhetorical strategies and close reading. Um, especially uh, in my experience teaching in English, oftentimes we're told that we can't teach content and skill in a skills based course or we can't teach Chicanx history and literature when we're trying to teach these skills. Um, and I think that this letter is example that you can do both and actually there's a lot of benefits from doing both and the archive can really help us make this possible. Um, so thank you for having me today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Excellent, thank you, Lexi. Uh, once again, questions for presenters, Lexi Perez in this case in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, Lexi's got about five minutes. And once again, at the very end of our presentations, there'll be an open time, 20 minutes or so for questions from the audience. Once again, if you don't mind using chat or Q&A feature for your questions. Uh, yeah, thanks for your question, Addis. Um, one of the really useful ways we use these materials were um, for students. We did short student research papers. And so in the class I taught, which was English 314, this is often students' first time including outside sources in papers. So the ability to use these materials to teach you know, skills like how do you cite an outside source? How do you find outside sources? How do you cite um, an article versus citing something from an archive, a piece of archival material? It was just a really great um, way to teach these kinds of skills while also teaching uh, Chicken X histories at the same time. So that was um, one of the big ways we use them in course besides um, discussion and close reading exercises. question in the chat that I'm sorry in the Q&A that I'm reading yeah so um speaking to the epistolary stuff uh that did not make it into this presentation but there is a section on the article version that I'm working on karma was asking about um being in conversation with bodies of work on epistolary rhetoric so um the the part in my article that I'm thinking about or that I include um, talks about um, is responding to some work on second second wave feminist epistolary um, and the um, scholar I think it's Margaret Jolly talks about how um, second wave feminist epistolary is uh, worth for discussing how women used letters to articulate needs in rather than to articulate rights. Like if we think about rights um, being part of big political platforms, like letters were ways for women to respond to each other's needs, um, which I thought was interesting in terms of this letter, um, because it, that's exactly that, right? She's asking, she has a need that she needs help for, right? That isn't part of a big, um, that wouldn't be part of a bigger political platform. It's a very specific individual subjective need. Um, and part of the, article version that I'm working on is trying to address that um, and sort of decenter that idea um, as just part of a, a mainstream white women's feminism and to try to think how um, we 
I'm trying to think about how I could bring this into um, Jolly's body of work that's talking about um, the the epistolary rhetoric of articulating needs and this ethics of care that women's letters um, can engage with. Um, so not in the presentation, but thinking about it. And then um, Karma also asked what I think about the ambivalence, uh, what you think about the ambivalence about the relationship between activism and affluence, especially for those of us teaching universities. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's what I uh, was hard writing this, you know, just thinking about the ways like straddling things like affluence and activism and as someone who um, isn't part of higher education and, you know, the importance of using that um, both, you know, when you have your foot in both spaces, using that um, to help those um, those needs that get articulated, right? In this instance, um, Blanco is cold calling Garcia. They haven't seen each other in years. Um, and the um, because she's someone who is in a position of power to do this for her. So it was just a really great reminder um, that when we are in these spaces where we have some kind of institutional power to help those that are reaching out to us or that we can we see around us, um, that that's that's how we that's how we survive actually. So um, yeah, I really kind of brought up those feelings and conversations to me. Um, and then uh, Dr. Gonzalez asks, would you then place Garcia as part of the early 20th century, um, the Hana middle class women intellectuals as Elena Zamoroche, Javita Gonzalez? Um, how do you think Garcia would have responded to Blanco's either or of domesticity activism? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I I haven't really thought about where I'm placing her in the um, in uh, in a in categories of the early 20th century and the Hana middle class women intellectuals that you mentioned here. Um, I think I'd have to think a little bit more on that. Um, when I was looking at her in the Movidas anthology, she was being included as sort of like a, a, a pre movement figure, like a like just before. But she actually also does a lot of work in the early 20th century. So um, I'd have to think a little bit more about that. Um, and how do I think Garcia would have responded to Blanco's either or of domesticity slash activism? Um, also a question I'd have to think about a little bit. Um, this question sort of came up in a class discussion when um, we sort of had a discussion in class about whether or not that, um, you know, more political rhetorical moves that Blanco engages in, how those would be taken. Um, and yeah, I'm not really sure if I have a great answer for that. My optimistic answer is that um, they would be taken, they would be taken well as a fellow, you know, as someone participating in similar activism, although they might be coming it from slightly different political ends and generations. Um, but that's something I'd have to think about a little bit more. Thank you for all those questions. Uh, they give me a lot to think about. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lexi, for answering these questions. Um, if I can ask either Adis or Lexi to make Nathan a co-host, and then he'll go ahead and have his slot. And then once again, we'll have 20 minutes at the end for all three of you to entertain questions from the audience. So if I can get one of you, excellent. I did that. Thank you, Nathan. Yes, thank you. Return. Go ahead, please. Okay, cool. Um, does can is does my slides look okay? Yeah, they're great. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, my talk is all about a chapter of my dissertation um, called uh, Filming Ghosts, Visualizing Memory and Loss in Documentaries about Guatemala and El Salvador's Niños Desaparecidos. Um, so just a quick overview. Um, in my dissertation project, I'm looking at Central American adoptee narratives in the media, and, and then I'm looking at how adult adoptees use social media and digital technologies to negotiate um, cultural identity. And each of these uh, bullet points is a chapter. So I'm uh, looking at a number of different mediums, including documentary, 
um, blogging and podcasts. Um, and then I'm looking at the marketing of DNA testing kits and uh, so, and then finally social media networking. Um, so I use a mixed methods approach of textual and discursive analysis. And then I'm in the midst of doing some qualitative interviews with um, adult Central American adoptees to help inform um, my chapters on DNA testing and social media networking. Um, so just to give a little bit of historical context for my topic, um, shaped by Cold War politics and US intervention in, um, in Central America, uh, international adoption from the region first became popular in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And in particular, uh, both El Salvador and Guatemala, um, there were thousands of children who were separated from their families by US backed and trained uh, right wing state militias um, known as Los Niños Desaparecidos or the disappeared children. Um, these children were often forcibly taken by militias and adopted by soldiers or their families, neighboring communities, um, or in some cases, they were adopted to North American, European, or other Latin American families, and often adopted under presumed pretenses that all their immediate family members had been killed in the conflict. Uh, adoptive parents welcomed these children into their families. Um, and then the second uh, group that I'm look at are uh, cases of international adoption from uh, El Salvador and Guatemala that are related to the social and political conditions of those countries, basically the dynamics of war, poverty, and social inequality, um, and the disenfranchisement of uh, working class and indigenous people. Um, and this is, I'm consider I'm adopted from El Salvador and um, would consider myself part of this second group. So for this chapter in particular, um, I'm looking, uh, my, question, my research questions are, how are trauma, memory, and ghostly hauntings visualized uh, in the return narratives of El Salvador and Guatemala's disappeared children? And then how do mediated narratives of uh, the disappeared and their reunions with birth cultures or families contribute to the negotiation of historical and cultural memory of the armed conflict periods in El Salvador and Guatemala? And how do these documentaries uh, represent societies, transnational societies haunted by the lingering effects of state-sponsored violence. Um, so in this chapter, I read the personal documentaries of uh, Discovering Dominga and Ninos de la Memoria through the lens of Avery Gordon's socio-literary theory of ghostly hauntings, and I put my textual analysis in conversation with the political, social, and cultural context of uh, the contestation over memory and reconciliation of state violence uh, in the transnational histories of Guatemala, El Salvador, and the United States. Um, so they're both, um, they have like two, they're two different documentaries, which is why I chose them in terms of how they tell their narratives. Um, Discovering Dominga uh, tells a story through a singular protagonist, um, the disappeared and adopted Denise, who uh, reunites with her, um, who's a survivor of the uh, Rio Negro massacre in 1982. And she, in, the, in this documentary, reunites with some of her uh, birth aunts and uncles. Um, her parents were killed in the massacre um, and other members, um, she reunites with other members of her Maya Achi community. And then in Ninos de la Memoria, um, it follows three protagonists and their ongoing searches, um, including uh, uh, an investigator for a nonprofit organization, Pro Busqueda, who helps to um, uh, reconnect families. And then uh, an adoptee, Jamie, who li lives in the US and then returns to El Salvador in the documentary. And then finally, um, a man, Salvador, who's looking for his daughter, um, who, uh, possibly is still alive um, in the film. So, or in the documentary, I mean. So in the theory I'm using here um, as a foundation is Avery Gordon's uh, theory of haunting, um, in particular, because I find that it's a, 
uh, really useful uh, way to um, understand the after effects of the terror of state violence in which ghosts of the past become visible in the present and it leaves um, those haunted uh, in a liminal state which um, in my dissertation I, I think of adoptee identity as cult uh, hybrid cultural identity um, so I use haunting to help kind of think through this hybridity and then it uh, significantly I think uh, the um, one of the one of the um, things I'm thinking about is how haunting in particular forces change and how that can be personal, but how it can also be structural. Um, and in, in this in these two documentaries, we see examples of both. And so this is uh, one of the protagonists of um, Ninos de uh, Ninos de Memoria, um, Margarita Margarita Zamora, who's at the Wall of Remembrance in San Salvador, which is a wall dedicated to those killed and disappeared uh, during the Salvadoran Civil War. Um, but first, uh, I did want to talk a little bit about um, discovering Dominga. So in this, uh, so I have two slides or two um, scenes in particular that I pay attention to um, in, in this documentary. So, uh, and I use Gordon to help think through um, how there's a lot of white middle class complicity in uh, in uh, U.S. intervention in Central America. For as an example, um, so her work uh, considers the case of Argentina in the 1970s during the Dirty War, um, whereas I'm obviously applying that to or trying to apply her theory to Central America and in which the Reagan administration um, led a Cold War offensive against communist subversives, supposed communist subversives in Central America in the 1980s by proxy of the Guatemalan and Salvadoran uh, military-led governments. So as a consequence, um, what I argue is there remains a transnational community of Americans, both Central and United, haunted by the terror of state violence. Um, so in this, in this scene right here, Denise and her husband, um, so she's adopted to Algona, Iowa, which is a predominantly white community um, in Iowa. And uh, I talk about how the transnational and transracial adoptee kind of haunts her community um, as evidenced in, in the documentary by her recollections of being bullied in middle school um, and being called racial. Um, being called racial epithets, and then her tears that her parents struggle to comfort, which is also discussed in the film, and then her husband being awakened um, by her in the middle of the night by, you know, screaming through her nightmares. And it's uh, it, what I talk about is how there's this scene in the church uh, at her community church that she goes to in which she tells her narrative to her community for the first time. Um, and I argue that it's an opportunity for the ghost to become clear in a small town uh, and how a small town in Iowa can realize that it too is haunted by US sponsored state violence. Um, still, it's important to note that ghosts can only open the door and they don't force the haunted to investigate their newly conscious gap in understanding. So in this case, um, the documentary, because it's a short, only one hour, and um, it doesn't necessarily, um, despite seeing parishioners appear to react kindly to Denise's story, it doesn't necessarily give us any insight um, into the outcomes of their reception of this uh, of this information um, in which Denise and her husband kind of share the history of US intervention in Guatemala specific, specifically. Um, however, I think the documentary does demonstrate the personal stakes of haunting and how uh, Denise becomes uh, more aware, uh, or I, I should say her past is affirmed that, you know, people, uh, including her adoptive parents, have told her that. You know, she didn't have any family alive. And in this case, this return narrative uh, kind of affirms her cultural identity. Um, and it encourage, encourages an activist identity as well. Um, so in the second scene here, um, we do see the violence of disappearance and transracial transnational adoption and how it's felt. Um, I think one of the most jarring things, and I found this in a lot of narratives of adoptees returning to uh, their birth countries, is that it can be jarring to watch um, her, in this case, uh, her, her white cousin Mary serve as a translator between Denise and her birth 
relatives um, because she herself can no longer remember um, her Achi language and can't speak Spanish either. So uh, her cousin's role as interpreter serves as a reminder of what Denise has lost and what has been taken from her through adoption. But at the same time, um, the, in this moment uh, of the documentary, she returns to the site uh, where her mother was killed and um, her, she has someone who's kind of taking her through the history of what happened. Um, and she, at, at this moment in the film, kind of rebukes um, Mary's translation. And it, to me, demonstrates that um, despite having lost her language, she doesn't really, her connection to the land demonstrates her memories. Um, and also, you know, I think demonstrates how nature, um, within nature, um, we can see uh, how the um, memories in which traditional documentation is absent remain. Um, in other words, you know, and this also kind of speaks to my spirituality, how, um, you know, nature sees everything, even if the Guatemalan government continues to um, deny, you know, what, what happened uh, during the 1980s, during the Civil War. And then just quickly uh, to just talk briefly about the second um, documentary. Uh, so this documentary is a little different. It's not from the 90s. It was more recent. It came out in 2012, I think. And um, so I'm, I'm curious in this documentary to think about how, assist, how does a society that refuses or is unable to heal, what does it look like? And what does this civil society-based movement to remember look like? So um, I pull from um, Roberto Lovato's recent um, memoir in, in which he talks a lot about this poem by a Salvadoran poet and activist who was killed by the military in the 1970s called Todos, in which uh, so this is a translation by Lovato and, and Javier Zamora, who's a, a Salvadoran American poet, um, in which uh, he talks about, um, Dalton says that we were all born half dead in, in 1932, which uh, refers to La Matanza, in which Salvad the Salvadoran army ruthlessly killed um, an estimated 30,000 indigenous people and other civilian who were uprising against social inequality. Um, and it, it speaks to this condition of Salvadorans being born half dead as long as the nation's history of violence is silenced and unresolved. Um, so in speaking uh, in, in Lovato's memoir, he's talking to a forensic anthropologist who, and they're having this conversation where he talks about as uh, our half dead conditions as Salvadorans, um, it comes because of our open wounds, wounds that keep us uh, in prolonged mourning um, and keeps our identities fragmented. So uh, I immediately kind of drew this um, in watching the documentary, kind of drew this connection in which the camera often pans across these broken Salvadoran families and the filmmaker, you know, direct, um, you know, decide, made this decision and they all have these kind of blank expressions on their face kind of signifying this half dead condition. Um, but Ultimately, what I find is that there's still a lot of resiliency in these narratives, um, in particular with Jam Jamie, who's this, uh, who's not pictured here. Um, she uh, was disappeared in 1980 and, and adopted to the US and then um, in, in the film follows her return to El Salvador and she um, is unsuccessful in her search to find any birth family and they use, uh, she works with ProBuscada and they use DNA testing. Um, but ultimately, despite, you know, not being able to have that full, I guess, truth found out about who, who she, uh, who her parents were in El Salvador, um, she finds the community there so welcoming that to me, it signals this moment of resiliency in which, um, you know, blood relatives, um, you know, aren't necessarily needed for complete healing, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so, um, I'm interested in kind of finding these moments of resiliency, even as, um, you know, people are healing from, from pain uh, of separation. Um, and I would say this is a work in progress. Um, so um, I, I would appreciate any, any comments you might have, but uh, that's what I have for today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Okay, so questions for Nathan 
from the audience, once again, through the chat or the Q&A feature. we got about five minutes for him to entertain, and then we'll open it up for all three of our panelists today. Nathan, there's a question for you in the Q&A if you want to entertain that. Uh, sure. Um, so the question asks, um, there's been some uh, some things written about racialization, intimacy, and kinship, like uh, that of David Ng. And I'm wondering how theories of intimacy inform your thinking. Um, yes, yeah, so I, um, I do use um, David Ng's work to think about the role of colorblindness in adoptive families. Um, in particular, how, uh, and this is, I think, changing in, in more recent transracial adoption families, but uh, definitely in the 90s and prior to that, through the, throughout the history of international uh, adoption and transracial adoption, I feel like uh, colorblindness has often been um, the principle that guides parenting and, and kinship um, in which, uh, you know, ad transracial adoptees are often told that by loved ones that they can see their race. Um, so that in itself is a violent act. Um, and I think um, one of the things that I'm interested in, uh, especially going forward with working on my later chapters is thinking about how adoptee support groups uh, online have come together um, to, uh, you know, be, uh, as a safe space away. Uh, these groups specifically are usually private on online and exclude adoptive parents so that they can discuss these, uh, you know, moments of symbolic violence that they face in their own uh, adoptive families. Do we have another question for Nathan once again in the chat or the Q&A, please? So what we'll go ahead and start then now is an open-ended session for all three of our panelists. And if you want to have a question for Nathan, please ask as well. So any questions for Adis, Lexi, and Nathan? Uh, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A for all three of them. And uh, just go ahead, type them into the chat or the Q&A, um, and they will answer them. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Please, 20 minutes of Q&A.
I don't know if you all want to address Dr. Chavez's question or Odyssey's question, but each of you get a shot. Um, there's a little bit of a conversation to be had, and I think they're they're both great questions. So, actually, let's let's start with Odyssey's question. Um, Lexi, then Nathan, and Odyssey, if you want to answer that question on your own too, please. Lexi, you're still in mute. Oh, no, sorry. I was just reading the question in the, in the chat. There's a lot of text going on. Um, yeah, I think that, especially for me in the portfolio um, and my time in coursework um, in English, there just really were not a lot of um, courses on Latinx studies, just the way the time that I was in coursework and the way that um, the course offerings in my department. So um, the portfolio just really gave me a lot of access to um, texts, conversations, discussions, um, professors outside, you know, it was like I had an extra branch outside of the department to really help me formulate a lot of these um, ideas. And also I think that my connection with the Benson came through the portfolio as well. Um, and getting to know all those really wonderful folks that do a lot of work that can really help our courses if we just kind of reach out. So um, yeah, a lot of the, um, connections to research and with teaching, honestly, I don't think I would have had those opportunities without the portfolio, just um, extra folks to reach out to and hear from and have resources to. So it's been, um, it was really important to me. That's a really great question. I just thank you for ask, asking that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and what I really, uh, I like one of the things I really liked about your presentation was the position uh, positionality statement. And I feel like that's actually through the portfolio program and taking classes in ethnic studies and, and Latinx studies is thinking about positionality. And um, that's definitely, I think, been one of my big takeaways. And similarly, um, like in RTF and in, in radio television film, there aren't necessarily a lot of classes that even think are necessarily thinking about race um, in in any way, so just being able to have that opportunity um, in in malls has been really helpful, and it's just been great also to be a part of that community of of scholars too. And yeah, I think that goes directly into my response to that, which was was um, particularly that I think the portfolio allowed me access to a group of mentors. For such a small department, what powerhouses of, of knowledge are being produced in, in that department? So um, I think it also gave me the confidence to be able to like suggest certain methodologies um, that really respected communities and, and, and had a, a focus on communities rather than just like the knowledge that was being produced uh, for the sake of the academy. Um, and so yeah, I really think that the, the mentorship, the support, the community, um, and, and the ability to, to teach and have access to, to that separate community that wasn't available in my own department is wonderful. And I can actually start if with a- uh, That would be fine. If, if y'all want to uh, speak to Dr. Chavez's question, and then finally, uh, Dr. Rosas, and we'll see if we any of the questions after that, but the conversation can continue to flow, so please. Yeah, so Dr. Chavez, I, you know, I, I consider myself a, a scholar activist or a research activist. And so every single project that I do, I approach with this, uh, this frame. And, and I, I'm thinking particularly uh, as a Black feminist and, and drawing a lot of my praxis from the Combahee River Collective, um, I think that, the, that this idea that the personal is political and that once we make our work personal, then we're making it political it is the theory of, of activism that I take through my work. And so uh, a lot of times as people who work in ethnic studies or who work on topics that are related to their own identity, um, we're told that the work is not rigorous. And so part of my theory of activism is to visibilize work that's being done within these methodological frames um, of identity, but then also to make sure that I'm centering communities and what they're saying about their own communities um, in the work that's being done. 
So that's not just a conversation at a particular community, but with a particular community. And so what that means is bringing more people in. Um, and so my theory, my theory of activism with this work is what ways can I not only include conversations with my, stu my students or about my students, but include them in the actual processes of the research. So I was able to use some of my um, research funds to pay what I called um, high school research coordinators. And my high school research coordinators did a lot of my um, transcriptions and then gave me ideas about them. They also did a lot of um, interviewing for me of their classmates, of their parents. Uh, they collected their own uh, oral histories. And then they worked with college students in the, the development of their own plans on how they were going to integrate things that they were learning into their own like uh, tra trajectories uh, or learning trajectories. Um, and I can also um, add to that conversation, particularly with this work, um, it really made me reflect on and think about activism as um, in many cases, these um, small moments of advocacy of like, you know, for in this letter for Blanco, the rec letter to get into college is is everything, but it's not necessarily something that, um, you know, Garcia was working with in Aglifa probably, you know, she, she was really concerned with um, her practice as a doctor and her patients and thinking about medical advocacy. Um, and how oftentimes I've even seen this with my students, something like a, recommend, a recommendation letter or um, some inside knowledge about something in higher education or um, helping them look for something online for um, internships or, you know, just someone that can help them access those spaces and knowledges that seem really small, um, but actually can be so huge for um, people outside of these spaces that are underrepresented in these spaces or haven't, you know, this is the first time entering into any of these spaces. So um, yeah, this project in particular just made me think about um, activism in these, in these smaller, in these smaller moments that often, you know, people think that, you know, why would we need to have a conversation about that? Or don't you already know that? Or um, haven't your parents already done this? And oftentimes that is just so taken for granted and not true. Um, and that's something I wanna be more mindful as, you know, I continue teaching as well. So a lot of, um, just a lot of reflection there. Um, I, I think for me, I, I've been really inspired by um, some of the leaders uh, in the Salvadoran and Guatemalan adoptee communities who have formed these groups online, like as an adoptee, like I growing up even before, because I was, I was born in the in then I grew up in the 90s. So I didn't have Facebook and stuff until I was like in college. So to, to think that now like how if I uh, like in high school and middle school to have had that community of like adoptees to be able to talk to and um, you know think through or at least have someone who I who could uh, relate to kind of some of the things that I was going through would have been really amazing and so uh, I've definitely been really inspired and have been trying to think about how um, and I don't have an answer yet but just think about how like my scholarship can um, contribute and beyond scholarship too, or outside of scholarship, I should say. Aris, do you want to reflect on Dr. Rosas's question? And once again, we'll go across to Lexi and then Nathan. So yeah, um, Dr. Rosas, that's a, a wonderful question. I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, especially as I uh, turn to defending my, my dissertation tomorrow. <laughs> um, and, uh, in, in creating a plan for this work. So, you know, we, we all lived this past year in a pandemic and, a, and, a, and it made me shift a lot of my work. And so I'm reconsidering how I can um, bring back some of the ideas that I had about this project in the beginning. So in a, last year, when I was going to begin doing a lot of the, the research on this particular project within the classroom spaces, my idea was not only to kind of use those ethnographic notes, but also to um, do some work around the engagements that teachers have 
with students based on these posited kind of uh, ethno-racial identifications um, and as well as like the implicit uh, biases about uh, language abilities of these these students um, because their language abilities differ. Um, however, I was given um, IRB approval by New York City on March 10th, and we know what happened after that. So um, I've been working a lot with the, the IRB of New York City, and they've been very gracious in allowing researchers to extend those plans. Um, and so it's my hope for this particular project that I will be able to gather some empirical data on how teachers are interacting with students um, who have been grouped as a, a as a homogenous group. I'm um, thinking particularly of in ELA classes as well as, or English language arts classes, as well as Spanish language arts classes. So in this particular school, as well as in a bunch of schools, um, schools have been, people have been advocating for a, a heritage language courses. However, what I've noticed is that they um, use cultural markers to place students in those classes. So basically, if you look what is prototypically at the center of Latino, then you get placed in a native speaker class or a heritage speaker class. And if you don't, then you don't, um, which is very problematic in a context where somebody who looks like me could very well be from um, a Latin American culture and actually have been born there and have a transnational relationship where they're going back and forth and being schooled in both places. And so I'm looking at, at it, particularly in the ways that teachers and administrators interact with the uh, students who sit at the margins of these kind of category projects, especially the ones that are governed by state and, and academic institutional policies. That's so interesting, Iris. Thank you for sharing. I was I, I was placed in a native speakers class for no reason um, back in college. So um, really great work. Um, yeah, so this is uh, for me like a much smaller project. It's outside of the dissertation, um, which has been a really nice breath of fresh air, honestly, to just have a one other small thing that isn't the dissertation. So I'm um, hoping to submit this as an, uh, a short article manuscript, um, maybe in the next like six, mo six months or so. Um, I'm thinking about, uh, I think it's MALCS um, or Chicana Lati Journal Chicana Latina Studies. Um, I think they're at UTSA. So that's a, a small goal I have um, for next year. But yeah, I'm just kind of thinking about it as a more of a, a smaller project that's been a nice break from the dissertation. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm so mine is uh, part of my dissertation um, and uh, I have another year, uh, I think, and I'll hopefully be looking to graduate May 2022. Um, so I guess, yeah, my um, this is one of the first times that I've uh, shared this work. So I definitely um, appreciate that opportunity. Um, but yeah, I guess my hopes are just to write and keep writing <laughs> for the next uh, year or so. Excellent. Uh, do we have any final questions for Adi, Lexi, or Nathan from the audience? Yes, kudos to all three of you, yes. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut a little short today's presentation and the Q&A session. Let's we have one more coming up real quick. Um, really quickly, on behalf of Balls, we want to thank all three of you uh, for contributing as you have individually and collectively to the portfolio program. We wish you the best of luck. Adis, Wish you tremendous luck. I don't know if you need luck, but you will get through tomorrow at the defense. Uh, Lexi and Nathan, good luck to you, both of you, particularly Nathan, when you've got a little bit more work to do. And we thank you all for participating uh, in this portfolio, Patek, as it were, under this new fashion here that we do the symposium. Thank you, audience, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at a future Malls Latino Studies event. And once again, this event, uh, this uh, symposium will be available uh, through uh, the mall's website on a link and also through Latino Studies uh, social media if you want to share this with others who didn't get a chance to attend live.
Once again, thank you for joining us today and we wish you all the best. Take care.